Yes, perfect. We can hear you. Very low. Hello. Can you see us? Yes, I can. Brilliant, then we're good to go. We're good to go, Chair. Okay, thank you. Okie doke, so we're open now, yeah? Okay, so the meeting is open to the public. Um, I'd like to welcome members to the 10th meeting of the Economy Committee. <laughs> Um, the public gallery, as you will know, has been closed to external visitors as part of the response to the coronavirus. Um, the meeting will be recorded on video and it will be broadcast live. And the video of the meeting will be available on the Assembly website. And just to remind members, as we do every meeting, that F4 on your tablet um, mutes it. So this is a special additional meeting of the committee to deal with the specific agenda item of the coronavirus bill which is proceeding through the House of Commons at Westminster and the legislative consent motion that has been brought in respect of that bill and will come to the Assembly Chamber tomorrow um, being brought by the Health Minister. Um, the coronavirus bill was introduced at Westminster and paragraphs 111 to 113 of the bill's explanatory note are at page 336 in your pack and this addresses the issue of seeking consent of the devolved legislators including ours. Um, are members content for the agenda of today's meeting? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so then moving on number one, apologies. We have apologies from Stuart also and we John also O'Dowd. have apologies from John O'Dowd. Um, um, and the Deputy Chair is in by video link. And we'll make a, a note in the minutes for that. Okay. And Christopher, we have haven't heard back from him, but he may be in the chamber. Okay, no problem. Um, I'm not sure if his schedule today is, is yeah. um, so deputy. No problems. Um, so then moving on to item number two, which is chairperson's business, and we have no items for that. So moving straight on to um, item number three, which is consideration of the coronavirus bill and the legislative consent um, motion connected to it. Um, so, uh, as a result of the need to self-isolate, three of the officials who would have been um, briefing us on, on this bill are not able to attend today's meeting. Um, there is a clerk's memo on page 5 of your pack, and the bill can be found at page 7 of your pack. Um, the explanatory note, as it says, are at page 336, and the legislative consent memorandum for the coronavirus bill is at page 409. Of the pack, um, the consent motion itself can be found at page 417. Um, so members will be aware that the, the coronavirus um, bill is the, the, it's an emergency legislation that's been brought. The, the time scales and the process around the bringing of the LCM have not been observed as normal. Um, and most members will probably, like myself, be uncomfortable with some of what is contained within the bill. Some of the measures and provisions are um, very far-reaching and extensive. Um, and obviously this isn't a procedure that we would want to be using, but we are, and the word keeps being used, unprecedented. But it is unprecedented circumstances that we are, we are facing. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we, we need to have the ability to, to make certain provisions for the safety of our community and the, the well-being and health of, of citizens. So. Um, I think today we will just focus on our own specific um, yes. clauses and schedules and, and discuss those in particular. Um, so we are going to go through the, only the, those parts of it um, and we are obviously trying to, to limit our, the time yeah. of the meeting because um, obviously the, the assembly is sitting at the same time. So we will be looking at clauses 7 and 8 and schedule 6 which is around the emergency volunteering leave. Um, and the payment for it as well as the conditions around it and then we will also be looking at clause 35 schedule 15 part 3 which looks at the temporary closure of education institutions and child care premises and clause 36 and schedule 16 part 3 which look at the temporary continuity directions with respect of education training and child care. Chair it might just be useful for me to flag up at this moment in time although that's the banner headline of those parts this uh, the economy department has no input into the child care or schools obviously we're going to be focusing on the hefe aspect of that mm. okay mm. um so if members would turn to page 15 of your pack um the wording of clauses seven and eight um of the bill and schedule six um and then there was around volunteering leave and the compensation um, these clauses in the schedule are described at page 360 of your pack also. Um, 
and clause 7 simply directs to, to schedule 6 which makes provisions for the emergency volunteering leave um, and sets out how payments will be made to emergency volunteers through their loss of earnings and for travel and subsistence. Um, an emergency volunteer will only receive compensation for loss of earnings as an emergency volunteer if they suffer loss of earnings that they would not have otherwise suffered. Chair, it also might be useful if I flag up now because I've sought clarification from the department. Is the department's understanding that payment um, for emergency volunteering will come via Treasury? and that it will be managed through the Department for Health as they are going to be the ones that will be managing emergency volunteers in that health and social care context. So that's just for clarification, Chair. Okay. Um, and uh, Peter, we had a bit of a discussion about this last week and we how did. this will actually so it, work. It will be regulations on emergency volunteering will be brought out by the Department for the Economy. They can also be brought forward by the Secretary of State this is the only devolved region where the Minister will still have that function. Mm. In England, Scotland and Wales it will just be the Secretary of State that does it. But here um, it either will be the Department of the Economy or uh, the Secretary of State if they ask permission from the Department for the Economy. So the likelihood is that the Department will still make the regulations because then they will apply locally. If that is not possible, um, for whatever reason, and it needs to be done in a particular way or in a particular time scale, and the Secretary of State still has the power to step in and do that, but must have the Department's consent to do so. Okay, so these provisions, they allow you, they set up the ability to be emergency volunteers and for a compensation scheme, yes. but it doesn't actually action it, is that? The regulations will have to do that, and regulations for us will be by negative resolution. Yeah. So as members will normally um, expect from a statutory rule, we normally have those under negative resolution. So it means the regulations come forward, will commence, and then it has the, the, the Assembly has the ability to annul those or pray against them, um, as would be normal in a statutory rule. So that's the process that there. Once the legislation is given royal assent, once it's into law, then they can proceed with the regulations, and that will come from the department. It's likely that there's going to have to be an awful lot of discussion, and probably it's already going on with the Department for Health, um, for the, the scheme regulations to actually be useful. Bear in mind that the emergency volunteering system will only cover health and social care. That's the only sector it applies to. So it's not for other things, but it's for that sector. Now, obviously, within that sector, you have more than just health professionals. You've got drivers, you've got all sorts of other people mm. going on in health service and social care. So it will cover those contexts, but nothing outside that. But it is a massively broad mm. spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, as we go through, there, there's other bits and pieces that will clarify who does what as well. Yeah. So that there's um, there's things that the health minister has to do. Then there's things that the economy minister has to do. That is all set out. So as we go along, we flag those up. Okay. So paragraph six, which is on page sixteen of your pack, highlights the kinds of systems and arrangements that can be put in place, including variations of cases, how payments are made, and limits on payments. Um, paragraph five then indicates how the payments will be funded, and Peter's already touched on that. Paragraph 6 outlines vouchers and benefits to pay for travel and, and subsistence. Paragraph 7 outlines the need for publications of these arrangements and for a statement to be laid before Parliament about them. So will we also have a statement We'd to also get that, yes. the Assembly? If, if the uh, Minister is laying regulations, we get a statement in advance of that. Also, everything has to be published. Throughout all this, all orders, all directions must be published. Um, paragraph 8 defines then what an emergency volunteer is and the appropriate authority to certify them. The Department for Health is the appropriate certifying authority and emergency volunteers are to be deployed in health and social care settings and contexts. Paragraph 9 directs to schedule 6 paragraphs 4 uh, to 31 to define volunteering leave and health and social care and then pay, schedule 6 is at page 93 of the pack. Part one of the schedules uh, sets out who is entitled to volunteering leave. Um, paragraph one, subsection three, refers to an emergency volunteering leave certificate, which must be issued by the appropriate authority to allow the emergency volunteering. Paragraph four indicates that the that here in the north, the health department, regional health and social services board or trust are the appropriate authorities to issue the certificate. Paragraph one, subsection one highlights that the volunteer is allowed to be absent from their work for the period indicated on the certificate. 
Paragraph 1, subsection 2 indicates that the worker must notify their employer in writing that they will be absent and send a copy of the certificate. Paragraph. Chair, just to pause. Just in terms of, of, of questions, do you want questions immediately or do you want to hang on to them? It's probably better if we do them immediately. As you, as you um, well, immediately as per the clause, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. So, Chair, clause, clause. Yes. If, you have, if there are any questions, yeah. then we'll go that way. Um, can I just confirm, in, is this legislation protecting volunteers that if they are volunteering within the health and social care sector, anything that might happen during that volunteering experience, they will be protected? That's the understanding that's yeah. given within the legislation and the explanatory okay. note. Effectively, um, as we go through, you'll see all their terms and conditions of their normal employment still apply, so they're not at any disadvantage. But obviously, when they move into that health and social care context, there will also be indemnity for them by the health department or, or whatever yeah. authority is running whatever they're into. So that's all being done through the legislation that the health committee was looking at this morning. Okay, great. So that is all indemnified, um, the liability will then rest with whoever is, is responsible for them while they're emergency volunteering, but they don't lose any of their own terms, conditions or benefits from their normal employment. Yep. And you'll see how that expands out as we go along. Yeah, I suppose it was more of a concern around what happens if their actions lead to certain consequences or anything like that, that the Health and Social Care Board will protect them under their own workplace medical policies yes. and all of that. Yes. So. All of the benefits that a normal health and social care person would have, in terms of that indemnification and liability and so on, will, will transfer onto this person. <coughs> but their um, other terms and conditions, their benefits, their pensions, etc., will still stay with um, their normal employment, but will be taken care of by Treasury. Yeah, and the, if that they, makes sense. Um, they would be subject to the same, I suppose, protections around what they can and can't do. You know, like training. You know, be, be mindful or considered that they don't <coughs> have training, or they may not have the appropriate qualifications, and you know what they can and can't do. I suppose that was raised again at the, the health committee this morning, okay. and the officials were indicating that yes, obviously appropriate training has to be put in place for these people okay. um, as volunteers who may not yeah. necessarily have experience in the context before. So um, PPE, personal protection equipment. Um, any necessary training, etc., will all be put in place for them. Data okay. protection, all that. Everything like that. Yes, that was that was the understanding we were given this morning through the health committee. Thank Are you. you first, Gary. No, no, no. no. Ahead, Gary. Pardon. All right. Yeah. So it only applies to those directly employed by the department or the trust. Not volunteer. No, no, no. The volunteers can come from any context, Never, but yeah. they must be certified by the Department of Health that they can be a volunteer, and then they are working then within only the health and social care context. So um, they can't be a volunteer to work... For St John's Ambulance or anything? Unless they are also being used in that health and social care yeah. context. So potentially people like that would be the ideal volunteer because they already have the training and they already are in a context. Okay. But they would still require um, the certification because they don't currently work for yeah. the Department for Health and, and Social uh, Care or any of the trusts, etc. So they would still need the certification, which will come via the Department of Health or the trusts or the boards. Um, and the, the part that the economy department has to play is the regulations governing how the actual volunteering will work, the practical worker-related aspects, if you like. Payment will be taken care of by Treasury. Uh, but that will also be then coordinated through the Department for Health, mm. is the understanding I've been given from the Department, the Economy Department. So Health will know who they are, they know where they are, they know what, what they're working. Okay. So it makes sense that they are then the ones that say to Treasury, right, yeah. these people have been doing this for this length of time, and this is the payment required. If you then had to try and transfer that back to Economy, mm. that would be incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. the, the other... Um, thing that's been flagged up in committee so far this morning is that obviously for most workers there's existing systems to do this or for people without work so there are um, there's pay YE ways of paying people and there's benefit system ways of paying people where this may be more complicated and further thought needs to be given is potentially for self-employed people mm. who aren't necessarily in the same system so the one would imagine they are on the system, yeah. mm. and that there is a way. There's always a way. There's always a way to find them. Yeah. yeah, you know, if people owe tax, there's always a way to find them. So there's going to yeah. be a way to find people. So does that yeah. is that okay so far? Yeah. And uh, the you. compensation it's for loss of earnings, really. Yes. So effectively, uh, say you work at 
this particular um, volunteering for two weeks. The periods are two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks. Within a 16-week volunteering period, you can only do one. So if you're working for two weeks, then the pay you would have had in your normal job will also be what you'll get. So it, it means that, um, and there's obviously exceptions to, to those who can do this, but say if someone's working in one place and wants to volunteer, they get paid what they would have been paid. So it's not that they'd be paid mm -hmm. um, a health service rate, it's if they'd be paid what they would normally be paid. Yeah. To do anything else would be so complex um, that it, it's just to get this up and running really fast. It just wouldn't be doable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay, so um, did I say that already? Certificates will be issued for two, three or four? Yes, two, three or four weeks, weeks. and they're only allowed to be done with it. The volunteering periods will be 16 weeks at a time. They are triggered when this bill becomes law at the commencement. So, for example, if you get a two-week certificate for a two weeks, then you can work two weeks within that 16 weeks. Okay. But you can't work multiple two weeks, so it's within okay. each period. So far, we only have one 16-week period that will be outlined, but then um, it'll be for the minister, our minister, economy minister, to then do the subsequent 16-week okay. periods. So volunteering is confined within each of those. So I think the idea is we don't have too many people there, too, too many people at once or at any one time, so that it can be properly regulated and we're not having a too many people to be trained, if that makes sense. So it's it's a very um, 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 I'm looking for a word. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very tightly managed system, so that it's not just a giant influx of people that we then don't know what to do with. So it's, it's very specific. The jobs will be very specific. The time periods are very specific. Otherwise, it would be too many people all together, and there'd be chaos. Okay. Okay. That's not a political or, or, or legislative term, but that's effectively what would happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on then. Paragraph 2 outlines the volunteering period. These are 16 weeks periods which begin on the day when Schedule 6 comes into force. Further periods of 16 weeks can be specified by the relevant national authority and regulations. Paragraph 2, subsection 3 indicates that for the North, the relevant national authority is the, either the Secretary of State or the Department for the Economy and similarly in Scotland and Wales. Um, paragraph 2, subsection 4 outlines that the Secretary of State cannot make regulations for the North on the volunteering period without the consent of the Department for the Economy. And paragraph 3 gives exceptions to the entitlement to emergency volunteering leave. Workers in businesses of less than 10, 10 staff, employees of the Crown, staff of the House of Commons or Lords, staff in the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly or our Assembly, the exemption for police um, in Great Britain doesn't apply here in the North unless otherwise specified in regulations around emergency volunteering by the National Authority, so either the Secretary of State or the Department for the Economy. So that will come out potentially in the regulations we see from the Minister, um, whether they decide whether or not to allow police here to be exempt or not from this. Okay, so part two then of the schedule outlines the effect of taking emergency leave. What page is that, um, So part two is. Hang no, on, I'm just. Oh, part two oh yeah, is it's the next page. Bottom of page 95. <laughs> bottom of page 92. Um, so paragraph five indicates that any employee taking emergency volunteering leave will retain all of their benefits under the normal terms and conditions of their employment. Paragraph six gives the volunteer the right to return to the job that they left. Um, without any loss of seniority. And paragraph seven sets out the volunteers' employment related benefit scheme doesn't include emergency volunteer sorry, if the employ the volunteers' employment related benefit scheme doesn't include emergency volunteering, then it is to be treated as including one. Chair, if I just pop in there. You'll you'll see as we go through this there's a couple of um, very innovative um, actions in it. So one is a lot of um, benefit schemes for, for normal workplaces and employees don't really include things like emergency volunteering. So this legislation effectively says, now it does. Mm. Whether it's there or not, now it is. And that's by force of law, rather than it having to be written in yep. to all of those employment schemes. So it protects the volunteer, whether that's in their employer's um, terms and conditions that they're allowed to volunteer for emergency situations or not. So it's there, protected in law. Okay. Because that's Sounds a bit strange. 
So the subsections of that paragraph ensure that an emergency volunteer doesn't lose out in any benefits or the employment, including pensions. So part four of the schedule, um, which is page 96, is it? No. no further on. It's page... It's page 98 at the bottom, going yeah. on to 99. 99 yeah. um, details the modification of the Employment Rights Order 1996 on a temporary basis for the facilitation of the emergency volunteering. Part 5 of the schedule is a general section that will highlight how the schedule applies to agency workers and allows them to act as emergency volunteers. Mm. So Chair, just, just to jump in there again, members will be aware that we've had um, legislation over the last number of years giving agency workers more rights, which ultimately means they can be treated as a normal employee of a, or, or a, the same as every other employee in a particular workplace. So it means they're protected if they also want to become emergency volunteers with the work they currently have. The fear would be for agency workers is that if they step out of a workplace, mm -hmm. that's it, they, they lose that job. This protects mm -hmm. them. So it means that they can volunteer too. It, just, it widens the pool. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to flag up was the part four that says modification of the Employment Rights Order. This is temporary, so unlike usual legislation where modifications are, are retrospectively <coughs> written into legislation, that's not happening here. These are temporary mo modifications in this piece of legislation that work for a certain amount of time but are not being retrospectively written into the Employment Rights Order 1996. It's important to stress that because I know it's something members would be concerned about if we were wholesale rewriting legislation. This is a temporary rewrite that is not being retrofitted into the bill or into the legislation. Okay? Okay, so then um, at page 102 of the pack, there are regulations. 34, 1, 2 and 3 set out how the Department for the Economy must make regulations. It can only regulate where it is within the Assembly's competence and would not require the Secretary of State's consent within an act of the Assembly. The regulations must be made by the Department for the Economy and will be subject to neg negative resolution so a prayer of annulment can be brought against them. Um, so our members, do members have any other comments on clauses 6, sorry, 7 and 8 and clause, schedule 6? No. Will any volunteers be entitled to any uh, additional funding allowance or payments that may be given to existing employees within that department for carrying out obnoxious duties or something of that nature? Chair, that will be um, sort of, there are provisions for additional payments, there are travel and subsistence okay. oh, yeah. um, clauses that allow all that to be done through either benefits or through vouchers. And any other issues, <clears throat> my understanding is, that from, and this is largely from, from what officials have said, is that because these are volunteers coming in, the very specialist jobs will probably still remain with existing health and social care workers. So it's unlikely they'd be used for anything, as you say, um, Mr. Dunn, obnoxious or anything like that. If there are particularly onerous duties, that again will be sorted out by the Effectively, the paying agent for them will be the Department for Health. So if there are issues there that need to be sorted out, the Department for Health will do that. That's out with the role that the Department for the Economy plays. So that kind of makes sense because health will govern the workplace that they are working within. Yeah. Health will tell the Treasury what the payments are and any additional issues such as that that need to be addressed. It'll be the context that they're in is where they'll be addressed. So it's hard to legislate for specific instances, but the legislation is broad enough mm. to allow additional payments or um, other benefits to be brought in. Um, I suppose until we see the actual regulations, it's not going to be totally pinned down. So at the minute that's covered, but it, it, not it, in a very pinpoint way. Does the department become the employer effectively? Technically, um, they, they, they will be employed purely from the basis of paying, but they, they won't have the same, because these people are emergency volunteers that are, are still being paid their own wages from their own job, that's still their job. These are volunteers who, who are still being paid for their normal job, so um, they'd be looked after by the Department of Health and, and any social care context they're in, but they're still employed by their actual employer. So. Uh, they can't be um, sacked or anything like, like, like that, if, if you know what I mean. That just would stop their volunteering and they would return to their normal job. So th there's no issues really there. 
that the Department for Health will, will necessarily have to be involved with. Chair. Chair. Um, can I ask, will that payment be subject to, um, ta will it be taxable? It'll be paid as normal unless there are other um, measures being put in place to suspend things like that. So okay. my understanding at the minute is anyone who's still in the job, still working and is still being paid normally mm -hmm. won't necessarily qualify for um, payment holidays and anything particularly. That's just the situation that there was yesterday, today's a new day. Yeah. Um, but as far as I understand it, the volunteers will be coming by and large, but not all, from already working somewhere else. Yeah. So they will be paid their normal salary with all the normal um, okay. um, subtractions and so on from that. Okay. That's so our would understanding there wouldn't necessarily be additional monies on top of that which would, could affect their income? But potentially um, that's where the ability <coughs> to pay them for travel, subsistence and other issues that arise like that will be put in place. So I would expect the regulations to go into that more specifically. Okay. At the minute the legislation allows for it. But a lot more of the detail will be pinned down in the regulations, bearing in mind, again, those will have to come before the Assembly okay. and will be subject to negative resolutions. So, again, I would expect um, the committee will need to examine those to be able to say okay. whether or not they're content. I'm not entirely sure how that process will be. Yeah. It won't be the normal sort of SL1s in a timely fashion, a 21-day rule and so on. Mm. So, really, that's what we've got our eyes open for now, is how the regulations play this out. Yeah. Peter, can I ask, was there any discussion this morning at the Health Committee around registers of volunteers yes. or how this so will be that, That's going to be a case of, because you get the certificate from the Department for Health, Social Care, Trusts or Boards or whatever, you need to apply to them to become a, 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 an emergency volunteer. And that effectively starts you on your journey. So they will give you a certificate and they will tell you how long so it would be two weeks, three weeks or four weeks. That will then put you into the system where Treasury will know about you and then you'll be able to be paid. And you, as it says in the, the legislation, you then need to notify, notify your employer in writing within three days of starting that you are now an emergency volunteer and send them a copy of your certificate. The legislation uh, means that they can't intervene on that. So you're an emergency volunteer, you're certificated, you're accepted into the system. That's who you are now and that's what you'll be doing. So your employer um, will accept that because that's what the legislation says effectively they need to be doing. So yes, all of those registers will, will begin to apply and it means then once someone has done their period of volunteering, and again this is still very much today, within the 16 week period they're, they're then going to be on a list and there'll be processes all in place for them to be doing that volunteering. So within another 16 week period, our understanding at the minute is they would be able to volunteer again for another two, three or four weeks, depending on their availability or their willingness, etc. So... Can I ask the chair? Yeah. Go ahead, Sinead. Um, I just said, I don't back up, but I have to kind of maybe get the reasoning behind um, the exception of the workers in of less than 10. Yes, yeah, so that's basically. Can, can you still hear us? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, that's micro businesses where, because an employer can't say no to this, that could really. There's going to be micro businesses that are very heavily involved in the supply chain where it's not easy to replace an individual. <laughs> so it's trying to stop um, those businesses falling apart because they're, they're probably still important in the supply chain. If a business is closed down and is no longer um, operational, my understanding is that if you've not been laid off, but chances are that you have and then you're available to volunteer anyway, but if the business isn't operating, then you may well be able to volunteer for this. But that will all be dealt with um, on application when you go to the, the other health or social care board or whatever and um, seek your certificate that will all be they'll go through what do you do now what skills have you got and if your, your business is still operating and it's less than 10 people then that would mean you're ineligible does that make sense yeah it does okay. but it, 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 it because a lot of our 
SMEs? Yeah. I think in those situations, a lot of them will have already closed mm -hmm. and rather yeah. than um, applying for the other measures that are in place for workers who don't have work, mm -hmm. they'll be able to go for the volunteering instead and oh. they, they'll have been paid what they would have been paid, theoretically. But again, that's all going to have to be worked out with the regulations and we we'll see how it works in practice. There's a lot in this that is, this is how it should work. But as I said, we're in a very live situation and you may find those exemptions that there are in this piece of draft legislation have been amended by the time it comes through. My understanding is that there will be amendments made today. Um, I, I know there was some suggestion that there would be amendments laid around the two-year period where mm -hmm. um, there would be a review by Parliament after six months. So I don't know. That was suggested as a possible amendment. We won't really know if those are coming through until later on today. So at the minute, because this is all very live, we're still operating on the basis of what we've already seen. So what I'm saying is um, theoretical. But I, I actually, you know, I completely uh, appreciate what you're saying in terms of the um, the fact that we depend on micro businesses here, and I think that's definitely an issue we want to flag up to the minister if members are content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We go back with that being a significant issue on this, mm -hmm. and we feed it through then to the debate tomorrow if members are content with that, because it is it is something that for here things are very different mm -hmm. in terms of the, the size of enterprises. Yeah. And you see in terms of also the what uh, is determined to be health and social care, are those defined in the other parts of the legislation? Just in respect for in the South, for example, they have a, a register of scientists. Yeah, my understanding is that was talked about a bit in the health committee this morning. And yes, there are registers. Um, and and you'll, you'll be aware of the uh, request to bring people back out of retirement mm. and so on. So, all of that registration process is going to have to be done, but that'll all be done um, by the Department for Health, and, and it's obviously it's it's um, other bodies. Okay. We we won't have detail on that within economy, okay. but yes, from what we've been raised at the health committee this morning, that will be taken care of in terms of mm -hmm. registrations and so on. Obviously, people who are volunteering from other places are not necessarily medical qualified. Mm. So it'll be a case of trying to skill match. Mm. So if, if you're maybe working in a business where you've been a driver, mm. um, you can be re-employed within health and social care context as a driver in whatever way they need. So it won't need specific qualifications or, or um, registration. But if you are a medical professional, obviously that's something they would have to look into. Okay. I'm just a bit nervous about going into other departments. I mean, that would be my understanding from what I heard this morning. Okay. Um, but again, I'm assuming we get further clarification of that because it was was questions that were uh, raised by the committee this morning. Okay. So are members content then with the the principles of clauses seven and eight and schedule six? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so. what we do then, chair, is assuming you're 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 able to speak tomorrow. That's a sort of like a very negative thing. Mm -hmm. We feed that through to what you're saying in the chamber tomorrow and um, during the LCM. Yeah. That everything's in principle. Yeah. So then, if we all turn to page 166 of the pack, um, which considers Schedule 15 of the bill, um, deriving from Clause 35 regarding the temporary closure of education institutions and childcare premises, Clause 35 can be found on page 36. Oh. It's just basically, most of the clauses are just like one line. Yep. Mm -hmm. So so the schedule is relevant to the depa department for, Sorry. Sorry, for education, economy and health. Yes. Um, and part three, the schedule is specific to, to here to in the here, north. Yeah. Um, paragraph 15 deals with further and higher education institutions and therefore falls to the department for economy. So obviously members will be aware that universities and colleges here have already closed um, voluntarily. Obviously universities have the autonomy to do that and colleges are within the remit of the department. So our understanding is that's all been done mm. on the kind of basis that's set out in the legislation. Mm. The legislation allows for closures on the basis of incidence or worry of transmittance, transmission of the virus. So. Effectively, the, the colleges have taken um, the decision to close on those on that basis. This legislation 
will cover that, but the colleges already had those sorts of abilities with the ministers consult in consultation with the, with the department and the minister, and that's already happened. It's basically, in many ways, this legislation has been, been written over a period of time, and a lot of these clauses will actually have been written maybe a few weeks back when, yeah. when those situations haven't already occurred and it effectively it copper fastens. Yeah. What it more importantly brings in is, and we'll move on to this in a bit, the, the continuity direction where the Minister will have a role in are the colleges safe to open again? Should they open at limited time? Should they only open to certain people? Should there be no exam time? Should they you know, not meet for particular periods of the time, etc.? That's where the, the part will be kind of more significant that they will give the Minister of the Economy an ability to regulate openings. That's coming out of the existing closure period that has already been flagged up. So the, the government at Westminster has indicated closures for a specific time period. It's just literally gone out of my head now. I can't remember. It is a specific date. But the Minister, once this legislation happens, then has the power to say that date is now going to be a new date so many weeks down the road. Extended then? Yes. So I'm not entirely sure whether that will then switch to the 16 week periods we're looking at for the, the volunteering periods. It would seem sensible that everything works on the same period. But I'm not sure that that will be the case. Uh, again, we see that as this develops. Okay. But the existing closure period protects us or, or maintains closures at least for a specified period and then beyond that it'll be the Minister uh, for the Economy that continues with those closures. She will, this bill will give her the legal power to do that. Okay. Um, Chair, can I ask, in, in, in the same vein that primary and post-primary are closing but are opening for key workers, I understand that may be the case for FE as well. Does this legislation we'll enable that? We'll give the Minister to do that. If I, if I highlight again, the, the fact that the continuity direction allows the Minister to say, you can open at certain times for these specific okay. people. So it allows, if that scenario needs to be used. <clears throat> I know there's been a lot of discussion uh, over the weekend about some schools can't really facilitate the amount mm. of um, key workers' children that they may need to. So there's some talk of bringing schools together or bringing them to somewhere else that can cope. So it hasn't happened yet, but it will give the Minister the power if it's decided that it would be safer or better or more useful mm -hmm. to move into a bigger, more central location, then it's possible to open up some of these facilities. Should that be the advice of the um, Chief Medical Officer and any of the Deputy Medical Officers, basically the advice from the Department for Health, all of this, all of this, is underpinned by that. So closures, openings, variations on openings, deciding to do other things, is all down to the advice of the Department for Health. So basically, if officials want to do a thing, they will be clearing it to make sure it's safe to do in, in, in terms of what the um, Chief Medical Officer in the Department yeah. say. So in relation to that, they can direct, you can direct the closure of institutions or the opening of institutions, but what about the staff? Yeah. So again, that's effectively going to be a separate issue because staffing will be um, a local management issue effectively because the, the legislation makes um, provision for governing bodies to fulfil the, the Minister's instructions. So governing bodies are saying perhaps all of our, our teachers or all of our lecturers or whoever are in self-isolation, then that's not a viable place and, and you have to look elsewhere. So. I suppose it's why the legislation allows for the continuity direction um, of being able to um, open or close particular institutions, make them open to specific people. It's, it's really giving the broadest contingency possible um, because at this stage, I suppose we're legislating for something we don't necessarily know how it will work, so they're going broad to allow um, the Minister to be to be have more freedom of movement, I suppose. But everything is underpinned by acting within her competence, which is part of what this legislation will give the Minister, but also acting strictly under the advice of the um, appropriate medical authority, the Chief Medical Officer and, and ultimately the Department for Health. Can I, on that point, can I, I raise a further issue? Um, 
Um, maybe it's not specific to this legislation, but I think it's a consideration that we may have um, for the FE College's staff generally. Um, what happens when we come to term ends, when the staff are not required to be there? And particularly with FE Colleges who have to fill um, contractual hours rather than having a term time to term time contract. And I'm particularly thinking of Coleraine in relation to the fact that they are closing early this semester due to the new build. So they were due to be out by May, and an awful lot of the staff will have fulfilled their contractual hours by May. So beyond that point, are they will they be required legally, or will they even be considered as a volunteer at this respect? Chair, that's that's gone into more detail than the, the legislation uh, yeah. takes way for. So what I do is I take that back to the board and get a response, hopefully before the, the debate tomorrow, because these are issues that will have to be worked out yeah. as we go through. The legislation, Chair, Deputy Chair's got her. Yeah. Go on ahead, Sinead. Um, no, it's on my as well. I thought it, um, by the student body, which yeah. uh, of the staff within the university because they have been to be uh, at work from home. So it's a genuine that they should also also be at home or, you know at hopefully uh as not facilitated yet. We need to know if if it's close to not just students. You didn't get that here, did you? I think I got the gist of that. I'm becoming really surprisingly good at lip reading now. Yeah. Um, the, what I got from that deputy chair was concern about lecturers having to be in the college if the college has closed down and so on. We, we'll investigate that. I know with, with um, some of the universities, learning has gone online and I'm, I'm aware that the colleges all put plans in place, or as far as I'm aware they put plans in place, what I'm getting back, for online learning. So in those terms, I think they don't need to. But to be honest, I would be, I wouldn't be completely sure we're going to have to come back on that. Yeah, that right. and yeah, just the the university's definitely put in place. They've for gone staff online to, go, yeah, um, to work from home as yeah. much as possible and would be facilitated. Claire, going ahead. I'm just. I'll register my interest at this point because my husband is a lecture, a college lecturer within the FE colleges. He is currently in college today. Um, I don't know if that's to prepare for online learning. My understanding is, is particularly where they are in the school year, and he would work within Korean, is that they have prepared their students to almost be finished up to this point, and it's a matter of facilitating uh, coursework. Um, but I, um, I, I do think there is an uncertainty around that. The other point I would make, Chair, if you wouldn't mind as well, is that this is a, the, the announcement made by the Minister for Education wasn't just in relation to key workers, it was also for vulnerable uh, students yes. that require support. And I suppose I would be concerned that, number one, the supports that those individuals require, do they have jurisdiction under this opening to be within the colleges? And I'm thinking about um, classroom assistance or other types of support, which has probably come from a health and social care perspective. Chair, we're going to need to yeah, clarify that. Um, as as I think that's the detail that is going to be really key. Yeah. And this is all being worked out and regulated on. Um, yeah, the, the issue around vulnerable people, I'm just not honestly sure how economies jurisdiction is going to work with that. So we'll go back and clarify that. And again, if we can't get an answer back to you, obviously all this is going to be flagged up to the department. So um, we'll expect an answer back from them, but I don't know if they're also then going to feed to the health minister so that yeah. he can bring up these sorts of issues when we have the debate tomorrow. But we, we'll seek clarification on all these and we'll come back to members as soon as we possibly can. I know the department is looking in, so if, if, if they can start working on that, that would be incredibly helpful. <laughs> or even start to feed it through, because my email is open. <laughs> okay. So, par um, yeah, so, paragraph 15, subsection 1. Um, gives the Department of the Economy the power to temporarily close further and higher education uh, institutions. I'm sure if I can just flag up again, the temporary is to the closure date that I can't remember, but we'll find out for you. And then that will have to be organised again and again by the, the, the uh, Minister once she has these powers. Um, it, it just means that it can be a forced enclosure, so it's, it's not... Um, that initial time period is worn off, we can now decide what we want to do. Once that first time period that has been nationally 
put in place has, has worn off, there'll be further dates coming forward, again on medical advice, um, and probably in a coordinated effort across um, GB, and I would have thought, you know, further afield, we're, we're going to be doing what everybody's kind of trying to do, just, just for the, the proper sort of uh, mechanisms to be put. Oh. Oh. It's gone. We're now four, so we're still correct to talk and um, John, shouldn't we deliberate. Once um, Mr. Shirt comes back, we'll be able to go back to decision making, but we will try and get the deputy chair back as soon as possible. She can still see us. Um, on on the link via the broadcasting, yeah. so you can still follow the meeting. Thank you. I, think she I don't know why I'm shouting there, to be honest. <laughs> but I know I know the deputy chair was going to follow on the live broadcast as well. We can't hear you, Peter. So it means she can still see. Okay. Um, so we're just trying to re-establish that now, chair. Okay. But if you want to go ahead. Yeah, and for members' uh, info, we're on page 168 of the packet. Yes. Yeah. So then, um, subsection two of paragraph 15 requires governing bodies to of the relevant institutions to ensure that closure is properly undertaken. Um, three requires the Department for the Economy to consider the health, the advice of the Health Department and to be satisfied that direction to close is a proportionate action in response to the incidence or transmission of coronavirus. Um, subsection 4 then outlines parameters of the temporary closure direction. Subsection 5 indicates that the Department for the Economy must publish details of any temporary closure direction. Subsection 6 outlines that if the direction applies to a specified person, then they must be given a copy of the direction and cannot be named in a published direction without their consent. Subsection 7 outlines that the direction is only has effect until the end of the specified period or the direction is revoked by the Department for Economy. Subsection 8 details how the governing bodies of institutions must abide by the direction. Subsection 9 indicates that non-compliance by the body can result in the Department seeking an injunction from the High Court. Subsection 10 indicates that the application for an injunction doesn't require prior notification to be made to the body. Subsection 11 outlines uh, definitions for the terms used in the paragraph. And um, then, do members have any other comments to make on Schedule 15, Part 3? No. no we so we'll leave the agreement until, until uh, Mr. Stewart comes exactly. back. We come back to that. As far as we're aware, then, <coughs> all the colleges and their outstations are all closed. That's our understanding. That the I'm getting some group feedback. Um, from the colleges, um, and they already had. Um, obviously, every every large public institution has a contingency plan put in case for closure, and so this is just a bit more, um, I suppose, un unusual than that. And effectively, that's what the colleges and, and universities are implementing now: is those plans. So. Theoretically, and, and, and what has been reported back to us is that learning has gone online mm -hmm. um, and we clarify the issues that have already been raised by members around contractual um, issues and the other ones that we've I've noted everything down that's been said in terms of highlighting. Um, we'll try and get answers back to you before the debate tomorrow and we'll also um, ask the department to flag them up to the Department for Health, just so that the Health Minister has an awareness, although it's going to be a very, um, there's so much detail in this debate tomorrow, uh, so any different departments involved, it's going to be, um, it's going to be very interesting, very complex, but um, anything we've not got pinned down, we'll try and pin down in any further detail, but members have flagged up, some of that will only come around the emergency volunteering leave, etc., with regulations once we see those. But again, those are subject to negative resolution and will come theoretically before the Assembly uh, and can be annulled <coughs> if the Assembly so desires or the, the committee so desires. No, Chair, I, I just have a slight problem. I've just got an email <laughs> in respect of procedures um, committee. Um, okay. One of us is moving in other and I'm winding and I'm told to move to the chamber now because no. of that business. Yeah. Uh, which okay. is which is a slight that's problem. Fair enough. Um three we can discuss but we have to the meeting is no no longer formally constituted. Um if we can get either John 
John, it's on the floor. Or should he hit back? On the floor, we can continue discussion. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, I think I have to be in. Is that right? Yeah. No, but yeah. that is correct. I have to be in for the whole entire. Yes, because you're, you're, you're winding, winding, so you pick winding, up with winding, everybody else. Yeah. It's, it's, it seems business has moved very, yeah. very quickly. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's yeah. the thing. I think probably they're the same lot of questions or comments. Maybe we can pick the meeting up better. Ah, no. That's going to be because we, we, okay. we know others are meeting in the, in the rooms. So we've got a slot. No, that's kind of what we're working with. Um, we can close the meeting down. We can reopen it again when John comes. If we don't get Sinead back, then we can't make decisions. But it doesn't stop members discussing and flagging up issues to me that I can then feed back to the department. And in terms of reporting back in the debate tomorrow, um, we can simply reflect that um, we had decisions made on the first part Members had raised particular issues on the other. If those have been sorted out, then members um, have had their, their questions answered, but we weren't correct enough to make a, yeah. an actual decision. So did you say we can potentially make decisions by correspondence? We're looking to see if that's going to be yeah. doable with suspension of some standing orders later on. So we can do it by that, okay. potentially. That's so what, we, say. what yeah. we have to do now is, because there's Thanks. only three, we need to go out of public I'm meeting. Probably going to okay. as well. Just so that'll be us. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee room 29.